Well, hello and welcome everybody. I apologize for our slight delay in getting started. Um, Ambassador Jeffrey, my colleague and, uh, and uh, chair of the Middle East program at the Wilson Center will be joining us shortly. For now, I'm Matt Rojanski. Actually, I'm always Matt Rojanski. Uh, and uh, I'm director of the Kennan Institute here at the Wilson Center. Uh, very happy to have uh, Professor Habiba Ozdal with us to talk about uh, Russia and Turkey's relationship uh, and a lot of the regional context in the Middle East, Europe and beyond. Um, I think this is a fascinating and a really timely discussion. Um, it's, it's always timely and one could even argue it's been timely for centuries uh, to talk about Russia and Turkey. And so I really, um, it takes me back into you know, all of my 19th century uh, history uh, as, I, as I read about the contemporary events. And I, I really just am very excited to have this conversation. Um, so rather than in just introducing uh, Ambassador Jeffrey now, as I'd intended to do, I'll, I'll just go right ahead and introduce Habibe. I'll offer the floor to her for some opening thoughts. If we're joined by Ambassador Jeffrey, he'll then come in. Uh, and if not, we'll go right to the conversation. But as always, let me remind you, you can go to the Kennan Institute's uh, website uh, for all the updates on our programming, including uh, this wonderful series called Global Perspectives, where we partner with other regional programs at the Wilson Center today, of course, the Middle East program. Uh, and, uh, and check out our podcast, Kenan X and the Russia File, as well as the Russia File blog and the Focus Ukraine blog. In the course of today, at any time, including right now, email your questions to Kenan, K-E-N-N-A-N, at wilsoncenter.org, tweet them at Kenan Institute, or post them on our Facebook page. If you include your name and your affiliation, if you have one, uh, and end your question with a question mark, it will make it much more likely that the team will pass that question on to me. Uh, and that I will ask it of uh, Ambassador Jeffrey and uh, Professor Ozdal. So let me start uh, by introducing Dr. Habiba Ozdal, who is Assistant Professor of International Relations uh, at Istanbul Okan University. Uh, her research is mainly focused on Russia and Eastern Europe, with particular focus on Russian domestic and foreign policy, Turkey-Russia relations, and Ukrainian politics. She's authored and co-authored book chapters, articles, and reports on Russian foreign policy and Turkey-Russia relations for various organizations. And she's also carried out extensive field work across the region, uh, including in Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, and Kyrgyzstan. Um, I gather that Jim Jeffrey is with us now as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Ambassador Jeffrey, uh, but I will, I will leave it to the two of you to decide uh, whether we still wanna have uh, Habiba go first or if you wanna lead off um, Jim. So. Let me, let me just say welcome, Jim. Can we hear you? Uh, yeah, we're good. Good, good. Uh, well, Jim, as, as, uh, as our audience will probably know, you recently joined the Wilson Center uh, as chair of the Middle East program after serving as the Secretary of State's Special Representative for Syria Engagement and Special Envoy to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS. Um, of course, Jim is a very well-known uh, senior U.S. diplomat. Uh, with experience uh, dealing with all manner of issues ranging from the Middle East, in particular uh, uh, Turkey to Europe, Germany, uh, the Balkans. Um, he's had senior assignments in Washington, D.C. as well, including as Deputy National Security Advisor in 2007 and 8, as U.S. Ambassador to Iraq in 2010 to 12, Ambassador to Turkey 2008 to 10, and Ambassador to Albania 2002 to 2004. Uh, his rank is that of career ambassador, the highest rank in the U.S. Foreign Service, uh, and he served previously as a U.S. Army infantry officer uh, in both Germany and Vietnam. So, uh, Jim, do you want to go with the original plan and open up, or do you want to start with Habibi? Uh, let's start with Habibi, because uh, that's how we uh, <clears throat> had set it up, and it was my fault I didn't get on in time, okay? No problem. Go ahead. So, the floor is yours, Habibi. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really very glad to be with you and also very excited to hear um, your insightful thoughts. Um, all right, so um, Turkey-Russia relations today and their future trajectory, that is um, a sort of a title that we will talk about today. Uh, the current state of relations between Turkey and Russia needs to be addressed um, in specific periods starting um, with the early 2000s, I believe, determinants, the main factors that shape bilateral relations has evolved since then. And um, therefore, I'd like to touch upon three main points in order to explain better uh, turkey russia relations uh, today and also to talk about the, the future of relations. So uh, the first point is going to be how it was possible to change the structure of relations from a very competitive way to a cooperative one. And then I'm going to switch to uh, the key 
uh, factors, what key factors shape common um, current situation and complex cooperation, which I like to call uh, the nature of relations currently. Actually, there is a cooperation, but a sort of um, quite a complex one. And finally, I will uh, come to the future trajectory, what to expect. Um, and I'll try to do that in no more than 20 minutes. Uh, so how it was possible to change the structure of relations from competition to uh, cooperation is quite an in, important one and an interesting one because Matthew just said actually, you know, when we talk about Turkey and Russia, we can go really back like five centuries long back, which history is mostly determined by the conflicts and wars, but uh, bilateral relations were dominated by a rapid transformation starting from the early 2000s. So we can say that sort of a new era, new era had begun uh, with leaders rising to power uh, in both countries and uh, shaped by centralized, very strong uh, single party rule on both sides. So we have seen establishment of multidimensional cooperation. The old understanding, which was one focused uh, confrontation and saw each other as a fundamental security threat was replaced by cooperation. The parties rather highlighted booming trading relations and look for further opportunities. Um, but there is a very um, distinct nature here. It is important to stress at that point during the early years of the AKP uh, rule, European Union EU accession was still top priority and relations with the United States were still very important. So what we can say is that uh, in the very beginning of 2000s, Turkey was officially recognized as a uh, candidate country for EU accession. In the meantime, Turkey was continuing to adopt legislative packages of harmonization to meet the political criteria. In 2005, we would see relations with the European Union to peak when it was decided that Turkey sufficiently met the political criteria and accession negotiations uh, would start. In, in between 2001-2005, efforts to uh, focus on relations with Russia was on the basis of economics and trade priorities with a very pragmatic approach. So considering this initiative then strengthening relations with Russia, we may see that in the early 2000s, Russia was, uh, Turkey was attempting to establish balanced complementary relations with both Western Russia making um, sort of trying to achieve this multidimensional balance and pragmatic foreign policy. Some very important international developments also um, happened, which fueled uh, this Turkey-Russia strengthening relations. Iraq war can be named uh, as one of them. One month one March motion, Turkey not to allow US soldiers to use Turkish territory is another uh, important uh, international and regional development that positively affected Turkey's, Russia's perspectives towards each other. And finally, we can say Turkey and Russia at that time were both having a common ground against this Black Sea-based security discourse uh, by the United States. But um, when we come to the 2010-11, what we see is that the main characteristics of Turkey-Russia relations were compartmentalization. What I mean with compartmentalization is that Booming trading relation, very looking for alternative opportunities to strengthen the cooperation, uh, political dialogue that intensified, all were mainly focusing on the positive aspects of relations uh, and ignoring the crisis or disagreements. So the two leaders stated almost in each and every meeting this friendly friendship discord and Turkey, Russia pursued a similar approaches from Afghanistan to Iraq, from South Caucasus, uh, Caucasus to Middle East. However, disagreements were somehow neglected. The idea was to expect a spillover effect. So positive um, and cooperative areas would somehow force political leaders to go further in order to um, resolve some of the problems, which didn't really happen. Because when, it, when we come to the 2010, those who were working on uh, Turkey-Russia relations raised the question whether Turkey-Russia relations has reached to their natural boundaries. And the very reason for that was um, Ankara and Moscow, despite of uh, intensifying political dialogue, never had uh, gained problem-solving nature, but rather agreed to disagree approach um, gain momentum. 
the Arab Spring and developments in Syria uh, would show these um, natural boundaries once again. As we know very well, Turkey and Russia from the very beginning had totally different approach towards the Arab Spring and the differences uh, in the interests and the perspectives of uh, the parties could, could no longer be ignored as we uh, experienced with the war plane incident. Now I'm switching to the second point I would like to mention, what key factors shape um, complex cooperation today. And I'm just continuing actually in a historical way there are two very important turning points that affected uh, not only the nature of Turkey-Russia relations, but also Turkish domestic and uh, foreign policy. The one is the jet crisis, which has happened in November 2015. Turkish um, Turkish uh, plane shut down a Russian warplane, which was violating Turkish airspace. And later on, just a year later, in um, July 2016, a COPE attempt in Turkey. Those two, as I've said already, has affected Turkish domestic and foreign policy a, a lot, but also, I mean, in more specific way, Turkey's relations with Russia and Turkey's relations with West. So two very ambitious powers uh, led by powerful leaders were historic rivals successfully co cooperated in many areas from 2002 to 2015. So what went wrong? Um, jet crisis, in my opinion, is not a reason, but rather sort of a consequence of a crisis, long-lasting disagreement on Syria. Uh, this was the incident which put an end to this cooperative spirit, which lasted for um, 13 years. And in other words, the war plane incident, we can say, ended an era of compartmentalization. There, it wasn't possible, you know, to focus on trade and energy and to ignore other differences anymore. We can go in detail why that decision was taken, but it, I believe, I mean, it is a bit a detailed. Uh, so therefore, I'm just going to leave this uh, to a Q&A session if we would like to um, discuss on that much more. The, the more important aspect is the result of war plane incident. The result of the jet crisis was a nine month long break uh, of bilateral re relations in every area, including student exchange programs. I mean, all the, all the agreements were suspended. Uh, just uh, the energy flow continued without any, um, any problem. But other than that, relations, bilateral relations were uh, suspended in almost every area. So, Russia rapidly uh, put into effect sanctions against Turkey in a way to harm Turkish economy and trade interests. And indeed, this, those sanctions that Russia uh, in, uh, in, imposed affected Turkish economy in a very, very bad way. Turkish economy was hurt badly due to those sanctions. So it was Turkey actually who took the first step to normalize bilateral relations. In June 2016, President Erdogan sent a letter to President Putin in uh, July, uh, Gulen movement, a uh, COPE attempt took place in Turkey. That had very bad consequences for Turkish foreign and domestic policy. But regarding to the relations with Russia, rapid normalization process has started. So the nine month long break to bilateral relations between Turkey and Russia came to an end after uh, Russia issued rapid reaction to the COPE attempt and support President Erdogan. President Erdogan later on uh, paid his first visit to St. Petersburg in August after the COVID attempt. So what we can say, what we saw was bilateral relations recovered in a very surprising quick pace during that year uh, after the visit. Why that was surprisingly quick, uh, we can say mostly the Syria here is a very important turning point because both Syria played a very negative role in ending the compartmentalization, creating uh, a huge crisis, and later on forced Turkey uh, and Russia to work uh, together once again on totally different uh, manners now. So it is a fact that relations between Turkey and Russia started in a different tactic, even in a strategic dimension, in a very different level of relations after the developments um, took a recent structure in Syria. It is very critical that parties now have been able to come up with common grounds despite radically different expectations and interests, 
when they established together with Iran, the Astana group. Now, um, for Turkey, this was quite an important because Turkish-Russian cooperation not only opened the Syrian airspace and territory for military operation uh, by the Turkish armed forces, but also it created so, sort of a new diplomatic space among Turkey, Russia, and Iran, enabled Turkey to communicate with the Syrian regime, even though it was in an indirect way. Um, 2016 COPETEM and the aftermath is indeed very important, not only in terms of regional developments, but also um, the fact that Turkey didn't really received an interest and support it expected from its Western allies after the military coup. That was a turning point in the nature of Turkey-Russia relations. Since then, I mean, from the very beginning, it was relations with Russia was one of the aspects of, of this multidimensional, pragmatic, balanced foreign policy. After the um, 2016, we can say, Turkey redefined Russia as a partner, which could be cooperated with uh, with it in terms of regional and global issues, including security. At the same time, by the way, I just didn't mention very important uh, developments in terms of bilateral relations, the construction of Turk Stream, natural gas plant project, which is a project of Russia to bypass Ukraine, uh, the ongoing cooperation for constructing a nuclear power plant in Mersnaki in Turkey that was to be built by Russian uh, Russian company, and most importantly, of course, Turkey's purchasing of an air defense system, S-400 air defense system. Those, despite objections um, from its NATO member allies, those were sort of the signals that actually showed us how the, the nature of cooperation now changes. Um, the S-400 crisis overshadows the rest, and I believe we will talk about this during the Q&A session. Um, it is still a hot topic, not only in terms of Turkey-US relations, but in Turkish foreign policy making circles, I, do, I believe this is the most important obstacles currently to solve um, in order to manage relations, not only with Russia, but with the United States. So uh, let me come, um, let me just say two more um, things and then I will come to future trajectory. So what we see is since 2011, um, in Turkish domestic and foreign policy, there have been a change from more multidimensionalism to a bit more anti-Westernism. Um, while Russia represented one of the pillars in this multidimensional foreign policy at the beginning of 2000s, now Moscow is being a balancing, driving force in the eyes of Turkish decision makers, especially against the Western world. This is probably the most important aspect that has changed regarding to the nature of uh, bilateral relations. The perspective um, and the attitudes of the Western world towards Russia and Turkey impact both relations with those two players and the mutual perspectives of those two on each other. So currently, one elaborating Turkey-Russia relations cannot ignore the role of their relations with the West separately. But mutual dialogue and interaction created new space for their bilateral cooperation um, with the impact of basically an anti-Western geopolitical discourse that was adopted by Russia and Turkey. Um, it is very hard to say, by the way, that Turkey-Russia bilateral relations are shaped by very rational, very realistic approaches, rather ideological, sometimes emotional and limited national consideration are uh, usually more decisive. We can see that in specific uh, examples. So future trajectory, let me finish by um, saying a couple of words about what to expect. The cooperation has started and intensified in the early 2000s, uh, but let me say that the lack of institutionalization has never changed, even though the high level cooperation council was established, as we have seen during the war plan incident, those um, institutions or those uh, institutional connections really didn't work that much uh, in the level that it was expected. So this makes the lack of institutionalization makes this cooperation fragile and very sensitive, especially during times of crisis. Um, therefore, actually, it's very easy to see shifts from strategic partner to, to historical enemy, especially in the public uh, consciousness and in the media. So to be honest, in Moscow, there is no expectation to, from Ankara to behave as an ally. 
it is rather a partner who can work together in, in a selective engagement to maintain the balance of mutual interests. Um, number two, I would like to mention about the future, what to expect is that rather than shared interests and common goals, uh, what brings Moscow and Korea together is a need to work together. Okay, so that, that what to expect is that we may see the lack of uh, US a strong initiative coupled with the US giving up, European Union giving up on its indifferent approach on the matter on developments in the Middle East, we can see that Turkey appears uh, directly influenced by this uh, Turkey-Russia relations. So Russia is the only political actor that is actively engaged in the area. So Turkish security threats, perceptions that uh, directly gets um, sorry, directly, um, it brings Ankara more closer to um, Russia. But as I have said, this is not due to shared interests and common goals, but rather due to the need to work together. What does that mean is we don't see a clear roadmap, very comprehensive foreign policy agenda, but rather very ad hoc, maybe short term solutions, process focused one. This is a process focused approach rather than a result oriented. So this makes again this relationship a bit more fragile when it comes to uh, Turkey Russia uh, relations and also there are certain limitations on that cooperation. Uh, last words maybe Russian Federation is very important regional and even global actor because it has global aspirations as for Turkey Russia will always be a very important political actor regardless of um, domestic politics in Turkey. However, the level of this cooperation will change uh, so much depending on Turkey's relations with the United States and Turkey's relations with the European Union. So therefore, policies of US and the EU are indispensably determinantly important. Um, we will see, I mean, we have seen this very recently when Turkish Defense Minister uh, Hulusi Akar just a couple of days ago when he mentioned the Greek model in order to um, get over this S-400 uh, missile defense system crisis. So let me finish by saying that we may not talk about Turkey-Russia relations without mentioning Turkey's relations with Western uh, political actors anymore and even this uh, shows us the limits of um, Turkey-Russia relations. Well, many, many thanks for starting us out, Habiba. I think that was, uh, you're covering a tremendous amount of ground. Uh, and I think that was a, a very good uh, high elevation overview. We, we've got a lot of questions coming in, but if there are um, any others that have come up, please email uh, Kenan at wilsoncenter.org, tweet to at Kenan Institute or post them on our Facebook page. Uh, before we take any of those though, I wanna give the floor to Ambassador Jeffrey uh, for your comments on what you've heard from Habiba or anything else you'd like to add. Please. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Uh, it made sense having Professor Ozdal go first because she provided uh, not only a great summary of the overall relationship, but she touched uh, in, in some detail on the points that I just want to, at a, on a superficial level, uh, emphasize in trying to uh, put together from the American standpoint, the nature of this relationship. It's very, very important. <clears throat> That's the first thing. Russia, Turkey relations are very important. Secondly, Turkey itself is very important for uh, whatever administration you have with whatever approach to the world, Turkey remains very important. Now, <clears throat> uh, Russia and Turkey are inherent opponents. Uh, as the professor said, this has a long history. It continues today. The main reason for it is that Russia is an expansionist power. Turkey is all in all, with lots of asterisks given Erdogan and his own views, a status quo power. Turkey is, for all of its problems, part of the West, both in its cultural affiliation with the United States and Europe, not the Middle East. This is a point I make all of the time with my Arab friends uh, in Israel. Uh, it is more oriented towards Europe. It sees itself as Europe. There's a long history to that. Even the people who are anti-European see themselves, they trade with Europe and such. Uh, and uh, as we have seen in the last year, uh, Russia has suffered three military reverses uh, in Idlib, 
in Tripoli and in Nagorno-Karabakh all at the hands of Turkey. So this is not a uh, 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 relationship of sweetness and light, but it is a complicated one. And uh, people uh, uh, misconceive it either thinking that Turkey has flipped to the other side or that Turkey is the same resolute ally that we had who can always be assumed to do what we want it as during the Cold War. Times have changed as the professor uh, touched on and I'll just go over a few of them. First of all, uh, after the Cold War, the Western world, NATO, whatever you call it, approach to foreign policy uh, issues moved away from geostrategic reality where a dictator like Franco could be embraced into NATO because he was anti-communist into a more values oriented approach to foreign policy. At that time, for about a decade of this first decade of this century, Erdogan was the poster boy for uh, someone who would uh, participate in the international order with uh, the uh, Sifa Poblim politic uh, and uh, a movement on everything from the PKK to the Anand plan for Cyprus to uh, President Gould to uh, uh, Yerevan. Uh, and the idea of a democratic Islamic uh, alternative to the horrors of 9-11. Uh, but then in the last decade, Erdogan has moved into a more uh, confrontational approach to the West in a more authoritarian approach when the world was still focused on values. So it seemed to be he was drifting. And every time, as the professor said, he had already developed, or not he, before him, uh, Turkish foreign policy, and then with him had already developed this complex cooperation with Russia, because that's what we were all doing. It wasn't uh, a betrayal of the West. We were all doing this until ultimately not uh, Georgia in 2008, essentially Ukraine in 2014 was the breaking point uh, from between cooperation versus competition with Russia. And Turkey had already been, as the professor laid out in uh, uh, splendid detail, great cooperation, particularly in the trade and economic area. So this is, and also Russia's anti-status quo expansionist policies are to some degree disguised because of its limited power, and because of the pushback uh, it has gotten ever since 2014. So it's very complicated, but at the end of the day, Turkey is uh, an opponent of Russia's and thus in any effort by the United States or NATO or the Europe to secure a stable Black Sea region, Caucasus, Balkans or Middle East, you need Turkey as your partner. It's a combination of geography, it's extraordinary economic strength as one of the top 20 countries in the world and a very, very powerful military. It's obvious, yet things don't work well. Why is that? Couple of reasons. Uh, the US is seen partially correctly as having uh, shifted away from maintaining its global security role, particularly in the Middle East, uh, be it the pivot to uh, Asia uh, in the last two administrations, be it Bush's uh, overcommitment to uh, essentially regime change and transcendental uh, uh, reform in the Middle East, which didn't go well, uh, America is not seen as being as reliable. You're more left on your own, and that means Turkey has to cut deals even with the other side, the other side being Russia. So it cuts deals with them all the time. Uh, in Syria, uh, the interesting thing, and I dealt with this every day is uh, overall, uh, Turkey, as much as Israel and the United States are the main opponents to what Russia wants to do in Syria. Yet every day or almost every day, there's some kind of Russian Turkish tactical deal or agreement or meeting or movement forward lurching in this direction for a political process. It usually doesn't come to much, but they keep on returning to trying to cooperate again for the reasons that the professor laid out. Uh, there is this complex relationship. This disturbs people in the West who want their alliances straight up. That is, you're with us or against us. Turkey seems to be with us sometimes, against us other times, that's troubling. Then there's Erdogan's own uh, unique approach to uh, diplomacy, which has gone from sifa problem, zero problems, to in Turkish, sifa mutafik, uh, zero allies. I mean, I, I keep inventorying who's on Turkey's side and I get Qatar, 
rich but extremely small and up until two months ago, very isolated in the Arab world, and Azerbaijan, which uh, is surrounded by enemies and, of course, has uh, extraordinary ethnic uh, ties uh, with Turkey. So that's not a good uh, position to be based on. So Turkey has to bounce around, uh, and it makes people nervous. Most of the issues between Turkey and the Arab world, and Turkey in Europe right now, and to some degree Turkey in the United States, are simply a continuation of traditional Turkish concerns and activities in its near abroad I saw in the 1980s and 1990s there. The Aegean in Eastern Mediterranean, Cyprus, Northern Iraq, Northern Syria, from the many threats beginning with, but not limited to the PKK that can come at Turkey from that direction, Iran, Russia, Caucasus, Black Sea. Uh, Turkey's responses to most of this are uh, on practical terms reasonable. The problem is because Erdogan has true problems coordinating and cooperating effectively with its partners in the West, who he feels, and the professor pointed out 2016, and I would stress that, particularly the disgraceful position of the United States government towards that coup, the disgraceful reaction to it. In Washington today, if I say the truth that that was a Gulenist coup, something I took at the time, People shake their heads. So I say, okay, show me any real intelligence report, and I've seen them all, or any real academic or other research that shows it was somebody else. It was Erdogan doing a fake coup, or it was the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Ataturkists, the, the Kamalists, or whatever. Show me the alternative. People can't. And our initial response, it could be, I could cite 20 of them, but my favorite was John Kerry's uh, reaction to Erdogan almost getting killed and almost 300 Turks getting killed. Well, if Turkey doesn't stop uh, treating its people badly, we'll throw it out of NATO. That has left real scars. On the other hand, on the American side, uh, the professor indicated the S-400 purchase. That has left real scars too, because it is separate from any other crisis we've had with Turkey in our entire history, including Cyprus, because it has gotten to core American defense interests. Uh, it is also affects core Turkish defense interests, including its uh, developing an indigenous defense industry and its ability as a sovereign state to decide who it will buy weapons from. Uh, so we have a very controversial relationship with a country that effectively is absolutely essential to anything we want to do in a big expanse of Eurasia. We got to get this relationship right. Uh, the new administration uh, is not even is just beginning to think about uh, this very very sticky problem, but it's central to Russia. It's central to the Middle East. I'll stop there. All right, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Um, we have a, a whole lot of questions and uh, relatively little time to go through them. So let me do this. Um, there's one I want to start with because it's I think uh, particularly important for uh, our Kennan Institute audience. Um, I'm going to bring in plenty of audience questions, but if I can ask, uh, we'll take them one at a time, and I'll just ask each of you to, to answer fairly shortly, or maybe just choose, choose one person to respond. But let me start with this one. Jim, you referred, you were very clear that in, in the Russia-Turkey dyad, Russia is the anti-status quo power, Turkey is the status quo power. It's an interesting formulation. Um, it seems to me that's a hard model to apply to what happened uh, late last year in the Caucasus, uh, where in effect the status quo, like it or not, uh, was that you know the the smaller, weaker power Armenia was occupying a whole bunch of this territory uh, that uh, most of the world recognizes belonging to Azerbaijan, and that but for pretty explicit Turkish backing, uh, Azerbaijan wouldn't have have initiated uh, a conflict which resulted in retaking a lot of that territory. Um, so I guess, you know, one, the, the, the two part question is, do you stand by that characterization in that case, you know, and why? And, and then two would be, uh, what is the balance of relations going to look like going forward there? I mean, that's a pretty bold move by Turkey. Uh, first of all, I'll do the second first. Uh, Russia still holds most of the cards. We'll see if Turkey ever gets its corridor through Nakhichivan to uh, Azerbaijan, I'm skeptical. Uh, I'm skeptical whether Russia will really welcome Turkey as a full partner in the peacekeeping mission there. But again, uh, uh, we'll see. In terms of uh, whether this was uh, Turkey being the uh, 
uh, anti-status quo power. I would say that Turkey saw uh, Russia's support for Armenia's position in Nagorno-Karabakh as uh, an example of Russian expansionism. Uh, as you know, it, uh, the war in the early mid 1990s not only took the Armenian ethnic area of Nagorno-Karabakh and annexed it essentially to Armenia, it took uh, I think some six or seven districts that were largely Azeri populated, some uh, 600 to 700,000 people at least, and drove them away and incorporated them as well. The offensive was largely focused on taking back that terrain and reestablishing, I think what Turkey would say is a better balance in the um, Caucasus uh, between the two. Uh, strategic uh, status quo defense does not rule out tactical offensive actions. That's my answer. Kind of here. Habiba, did you want to come in on that as well, or uh, you would take the next question? Well, I would probably just um, quite agree with just uh, what Ambassador Jeffrey said. It, it, we don't really see in particular instances that Russia is fully, you know, willing to fully cooperate with Turkey. The same can be applicable to the Nagorno-Karabakh and even when it comes to the negotiations regarding the future of Syria, what we have seen is Russia was much more willing to negotiate with um, United States than Turkey, actually. Once Turkey changed its foreign policy, its approach to uh, Syria, only then it was welcomed on board. So that is quite an important detail, let me uh, just stress. Okay, great. Let me uh, change gears. We have a number of audience questions uh, that, that look at the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, so, uh, in particular, uh, the, there's a question from Chris Mazel at Chevron who asks uh, whether there's, uh, despite the, the proxy wars, if you will, that we've talked about, uh, Syria, Libya, uh, perhaps in, in the Caucasus as well, uh, it looks like um, uh, Russia and Turkey are sort of aligning around Cyprus. Uh, how does that work out in the context of uh, gas in the Eastern Mediterranean, where uh, if I, my understanding is if, uh, Northern Cyprus kind of goes the, the full separatist route, pulls out from the process, et cetera. This could really uh, complicate uh, gas rights in the region. Obviously, Russia is, you know, a, a major energy power. What's what's your what's your assessment of that? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I mean, Eastern Mediterranean, Libya, uh, those are sort of the Cyprus, you know, the status of the Cyprus, the future of the Cyprus. Those are uh, sort of a very hard topics for Turkey-Russia relations since it is hard to find out a common ground, let me say common interest first of all. Um, when it is the Eastern Mediterranean, Turkey is even in the Libya, you know, there are uh, very important discussions, ongoing discussion, what is the aim of Turkish foreign policy, economically, what is the gain, how positive results are expected. Uh, does it make sense, um, you know, when you measure uh, the positive and the negative outcomes. As uh, Ambassador Jeffrey just mentioned, from zero problem with neighbors to zero neighbors, actually, you know, um, th that is quite an interesting uh, issue to discuss. But I'm not going to go in detail. Uh, since then, we have to understand Turkish foreign policy in different manners. First of all, I mean, look at the operations that have been carried out uh, Syria, Iraq, uh, Libya. Eastern Mediterranean, um, the you know the ongoing disagreement with Greece, like those are much extending Turkey's not only political but also military um, power. But whether the capacity and expectations are overlapping, that is another question. To be honest, in the Eastern Mediterranean, Turkey very lately tried to intervene in order to change the already existing status quo, which was so much. Um, in a disadvantage, putting Turkey in a disadvantageous position, but is it by itself only able to change this status quo? My answer would be no. Um, so therefore, Russia as a giant energy producer would probably not so much um, eager be eager to find the new sources. Uh, the future of Cyprus, the status quo of Cyprus, you know, unless we solve the status quo of Cyprus, the future of Cyprus, how to um, 
you know, have to negotiate on the uh, energy resources. This is another um, area, hot topic once again uh, to talk about. So what I would say probably uh, when it comes to the Eastern Mediterranean is that it is just an only another disputed area. All right, there. Because, Matt, because yes. this is such an important issue. First of all, uh, I would disagree a little bit with Habibi with the exception of Libya, limited exception, as that's an offshoot of the Eastern Mediterranean, all of these conflicts that she cited are in Turkey's near abroad. They're in areas of extraordinary uh, national security interest for Turkey, and we were dealing with them in the 1980s and the 1990s. Let me take the Eastern uh, Med and put it in a different context, because I think it says a lot about Turkey and a lot about our approach to Turkey. Uh, the issue of having a hostile power, that hostile power in Turkish eyes is Hellenicism, occupying a chain like a necklace of islands right off the coast of Turkey from Cyprus to almost at Limnos within sight of the Dardanelles has been an extraordinary diplomatic problem for the international community for a century since the six power agreements of 1914 ending the second Balkan war until the Anand plan for Cyprus in 2004. And the basic uh, way that this has fallen out is Turkey sees real national interests being constrained, be it with the Turkish minority on Cyprus, be it with its uh, access to the high seas and its uh, rights to operate and to uh, have uh, uh, mineral uh, access to the uh, seabed uh, in these areas versus uh, the argument made by the Greeks and the Cypriots of national sovereignty absolute and law of the sea and other uh, diplomatic uh, uh, instruments that they point to. The international community traditionally has tried to balance the two in various ways from, again, the Anand plan to the demilitarization of the islands. Uh, the problem is that Erdogan has so provoked the international community that a change to the status quo negative to an important power, Turkey, which was this consortium in the Eastern Mediterranean for gas with site, which is kind of a rogues gallery of people who normally don't get along, Israel, Egypt, uh, uh, even I think the Palestinians indirectly, Lebanon and Cyprus, uh, was seen uh, not as an affront to Turkey that requires fixing, but rather a normal thing following the uh, law of the sea. And Turkey's reaction to it was seen as provocative and aggressive because Erdogan doesn't know how to do anything, even when he may be at least partially in the right in a non-aggressive, non-provocative way. So he got himself in a corner. He's trying to dig out of it now. He probably will, but it was a very, very bad mark on his uh, foreign policy. Well, uh, we have uh, so many disparate questions to get to in 15 minutes that uh, I'm going to take this one, uh, which is quick and, and rather uh, broad from Bergam Ersas from the Voice of Turkey, uh, who directs it to you, Ambassador Jeffrey, asking, how do you expect the U.S. and Turkey to navigate the minefield of issues surrounding the S-400 in Syria? And we have a number of kind of follow-up questions uh, on, on both those topics, which I'll try to get in if we have time. Um. If Turkey and the United States are not prepared both, both to compromise on their maximalist positions on the S-400, the US is, it just has to go away, you bad ally. The Turkish one is, we're a sovereign country, we'll do whatever we want. If there is not significant modifications on both sides to that policy, uh, there will not be a fruitful uh, relationship between the two. That will have a huge impact on the containment of Russia in that broad area I described, American goals in Iraq, Syria, and in the broader Middle East. So it's a very, very important issue. I don't know how this administration is going to come down because what interferes in this, which uh, was not a problem in the Trump administration, is the distaste for Erdogan personally and the distaste for Erdogan's domestic policies 
uh, among many of the people who uh, staffed the new administration. There was some of that in the last administration, but it was uh, counted, of course, by number one, Donald Trump liking Erdogan and not worrying about what he was doing uh, domestically. That will not be the case here. So this is, a, this is a really serious problem that this administration knows it has a problem. It doesn't have an answer to it. Great. I, let me, uh, I, I know we, we need to get to some Syria questions, so let me uh, pose a, a very specific one there. Um, in, uh, in Idlib, my understanding is that the uh, Turkish side is ready to engage uh, with Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. Uh, the U.S. is not. Um, is there, uh, first of all, is there a, a Russian uh, perspective on that that matters? And second, uh, you know, <laughs> Is basically, is, is the U.S. prepared to step aside and let the Russians and the Turks resolve this? I'll, I'll take the first stop. As, as, as uh, Far Minister Lavrov personally attacked me twice on making comments that sounded uh, a little bit soft on Hayat al-Sham, uh, I know well the Russian position, which is they're evil terrorists to the worst uh, because they're an effective force against Assad. Thus, they control most of the ground in uh, that the Turkish army doesn't control in Idlib. Uh, Turkey has had to deal mainly indirectly with it. Uh, I think that there are various uh, forces, uh, probably among the Turks and certainly in Hayat al-Sham who wanna quote, come in from the cold, become like the Taliban, an interlocutor of the United States in the West because they're no longer international terrorists, they're freedom fighters trying to take their country back from Assad. We'll see how this goes. Uh, we were cautious about that in the uh, U.S. administration because of the very strong reaction that got from the Russians whenever we looked in that direction, but also because of the, uh, you know, I I any offshoot of Al Qaeda, and this is of course Al Nusra, by Al Nusra in this case, uh, is like the third rail in American domestic politics. So you have to be cautious how this administration will tackle it. I don't know. Habiba, do you want to come in on any of that? Well, I would just um, maybe mention several things. As for the S-400 um, missile crisis, just Ambassador Jeffrey stressed how important Turkey is regionally uh, from the eyes of the Washington, and I'm very relieved to hear that since we have been hearing like so many criticism over, um, you know, both parties accusing each other of not being so much responsible regarding to their um, security, um, you know, trap perceptions and security priorities. So I hope these compromises uh, actually find, found um, takes place. Uh, from the Turkish uh, side, I can hear, I mean, hearing uh, Hulusi Akar um, yesterday, a couple of days ago, it was quite a positive, let, let's, let's see whether it's going to have any response from the US side. But I believe, um, I'm just going to stress once again that um, Turkey's relations with the United States, Turkey's relations with the European Union are crucially important. They do, those relations do shape even um, Turkey's relations with the other political parties. And um, I mean, it is not probably the most, uh, you know, relieving time uh, when it comes to the domestic politics, but still um, those complex issues who, which affect each other needs to be considered. When it comes to Syria, the, um, you know, the PKK is a terrorist organization for the United States, for sure. PKK is, is not a terrorist organization list of Russia. Turkey and Russia do handle this. But when it comes to the YPG, um, US, uh, American um, support to the YPG, that here is a crucial one that actually somehow locks further cooperation uh, between Turkey and US in Syria. So that makes us thinks once again whether you know there can be any sort of an agreement um, but I'm not so positive on that um, and the YPG um, the, the ongoing it seems like the Biden administration will continue to support YPG I mean this is these are the very initial thoughts but it seems to me um, that will continue um, that the Turkey directly links YPG with the PKK as you know very well the PKK I mean that is not only the foreign policy issue, but also the domestic politics issue. Just two days ago, Turkey lost 13 uh, civilians which were killed by the PKK. That raised once again the tension um, between Turkey and the United States. As I have said, this doesn't make that much of an issue when it comes to the Russia. Russia also, uh, I mean, 
I recognize YPG, negotiate with them, etc. But I mean, that doesn't really make that much effect, negative effect with Moscow, but it is um, crucial when it comes to Washington. So that's actually a perfect segue, Habiba, to the, the last kind of cluster of questions that I'll try to get to in the time we have left, um, which is really about the, the US-Russia-Turkey triangle, um, which uh, arguably uh, brings in Europe and China as well and making like a pentagram. But, um, you know, the, there are a couple of questions. Uh, Arama Avetisian uh, from Voice of America asks, uh, what extent is the authoritarian uh, nature of both leaders in Turkey and Russia impact Turkish-Russian relations. And I think there's a very important uh, corollary to that, um, which is uh, if, in fact, the Biden administration is going to pursue a kind of more muscular democracy promotion agenda, uh, a, a kind of conference of democracies, et cetera, you know, does that force that kind of zero-sum choice, Ambassador Jeffrey, that you had been uh, rejecting, pushing back against with sort of Turkey is either fully in one camp or fully in the other? Um, you know, in that, in that obviously Turkey is going to have some issues there. And then related to that is, um, you know, we have a question from uh, Colonel uh, Gunther Rosenitz from the Austrian military and, and from several others, and I apologize for not crediting everybody, but it's basically around the issue of uh, the United States and to some extent Europe also uh, intentionally creating zero-sum choices uh, for the rest of the world through sanctions. Uh, you know, Russia does things in Ukraine, Russia does things uh, in, in Syria, Russia does election interference, whatever it may be. And the goal is to create a zero sum choice in order to isolate Russia. That's very explicit. Um, you know, what is Turkey's attitude towards that, given that it is trying to maintain this kind of uh, rapprochement attitude with Russia and a whole host of areas. So I put all of that out there. And then I think if you each get two or three minutes final word, that would be just perfect. Um, on, on the sanctions policy, it's a tool of foreign policy. Uh, it's a non-lethal hard power tool. So that's like all hard power tools. It has collateral damage. Uh, it forces countries in the middle who don't want to take sides to, uh, uh, to some degree take sides. And uh, uh, I'll defend our use of sanctions, be it against Russia in uh, Crimea and Ukraine, or our use of sanctions against uh, Iran and uh, uh, Syria. But sanctions are a means to an end, an effective use of sanctions with those on Iran that got Iran to the negotiating table on the nuclear agreement. But sanctions have a secondary usage, uh, which uh, we don't really talk about because it's somewhat uh, hygienically problematic. And that is sanctions weaken your opponent. They thus do two things. You're dealing with a less powerful opponent you know, it's why we bombed the cities of uh, Germany. It didn't have an immediate uh, military effect and it came at great cost, but our assumption was it makes them weaker economically and politically. Uh, the second thing is sanctions serve as a deterrent. Gee, if the sanctions are at all biting, then maybe the country that we're trying to get to change its behavior will not grab another Crimea uh, or in the case of Iran, you know, start another nuclear uh, uh, cycle. And uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, like all other tools. And as far as the, um, Jim, as far as the democracy issue, kind yeah. of uh, authoritarian uh, leaning. This, this administration is facing, uh, among the many uh, challenges to its operating assumptions when it came in, a major one there. All administrations come in thinking they can do everything, particularly in the year 2021. The United, the United States foreign policy is all about priorities and making choices. It's gonna to have to decide if its role in the world is going to be to uphold an essentially security-based international order, which means, again, you go back to embracing people like Franco, or whether its role is to turn the world into Denmark, in which case you're gonna have real problems in the Middle East, not just with Turkey, but with Saudi Arabia, with Egypt, and as far as the Palestinian issue goes, even with Israel and without those four countries, just tell me how you get a plane to ship into that region. Thank you. All right, Habiba, the final word is yours on, on either of those topics or anything else. All right, well, let me just say that in, in any case of this democracy promotion, uh, that wouldn't will not be welcomed 
Plus, it's going to be elaborated as a direct threat to um, Erdogan himself, President Erdogan himself. So actually, uh, if this, there are some uh, choices are to be um, dictated, then we can see from the Turkish perspective that President Erdogan, the Nationalist Movement Party in Turkey, and the Eurasianist group, which argue to get closer to Russia and China, um, who actually believe that the current international system is not Western centric, will probably get much more uh, attention. And then Turkey would probably pursue interests that will um, bring Turkey um, closer to Russia and China. So I hope, to, I mean, I hope that more inclusive understanding rather than dictating, you know, these uh, specific uh, programs or sanctions, I hope, would be re-elaborated in order to have more uh, inclusive approach. Um, otherwise, we would probably see much, um, I mean, relations getting even worse than they are today. Well, let me thank you both. We've covered uh, more ground than is reasonable for any hour-long conversation, and it's only possible because of uh, your deep expertise. We're very, very appreciative to you. Uh, I apologize to those audience members whose questions I couldn't get to explicitly, but uh, I hope that we were able to at least address part of them. Uh, and this is certainly, I think, uh, a fast-moving topic at, at the same time that it's an eternal topic. Uh, as Habiba correctly said, it goes back at least five centuries. So uh, mm -hmm. it's something I think we can continue to pay attention to uh, in the months ahead, and we certainly will. So uh, thank you again, both of you, and thank you to our audience.